I really love that song a lot. And can we say thanks to our music team? What a, what a gift. There's just something about, um, it doesn't really matter whether you fancy yourself able to sing or not. There's just something about how we're wired up as human beings that the combination of, of words and melody and rhythm and, and movement and, and atmosphere and all, like it communicates things to us about God that we can't receive any other way. And this morning, I, I love that we sang this song, Make Room. I will make room for you. Oh, think about that for just a minute, friends. Your calendars, your relationships, your crazy schedules with kids going back to school and your finances and work and all of this. I, what does it look like? I will make room for you to do whatever you want to because your way is better. I just, I love that that we're prepared because that is exactly what we're talking about this morning in Romans chapter six. Friends, we're jumping back into this Roman series, chapter six, and it is all about making more room for God to work in our lives through our relationship with Jesus. So do me a favor and turn there with me. Grab, grab a paper Bible from the chair in front of you there or your phone or your tablet or whatever and head to Romans six. We need to have this uh, in front of our eyeballs uh, because let's be honest, Romans is hard. <laughs> it's a hard, hard book to understand, right? It's, you, you open up the book, and if you've ever tried to read Romans just to encourage yourself or to develop yourself spiritually, you get into Romans and you read, and you're like, oh boy. I mean, that seems important, and I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> and so, I mean, you gotta, have, you gotta have some help to figure out what's going on in Romans. I was telling the production team earlier this morning when we were doing mic checks and stuff, I'm like, you know, someday in eternity, I'm gonna grab a couple cappuccinos and I'm gonna go find the Apostle Paul and I'm gonna sit, he's the dude who wrote Romans through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and I'm gonna sit down next to him and say, man, I got your cappuccino and um, why didn't you just use normal words? Why'd you have to use all the big ones that we're still talking about 2,000 years later? Anyway, Romans is hard, but it's worth it. It's worth it. And so in chapter six, we're talking about making room for God. My name's Pastor Jeff. I lead the creative team. Well, I mean, my name's not Pastor Jeff. My name is Jeff Lovin, and I'm one of the pastors on staff. I lead the creative team here, and it's, it's my privilege to be with you all this morning. We launched this series two weeks ago, and we looked at Romans chapter one and two, and that's all about understanding sin, right? It's a word that gets thrown around a lot in the Bible and in uh, Christian churches. What is sin? It's simply missing the mark. Like there's, think of it, it's an archery term, actually, right? Think of it like the archery target downrange, uh, that mark on the target, uh, we miss it. The arrow like vroom, flies off to the side. That's what sin is. God has a mark, has a target for our lives. And if, we're, if we hit the target, we will experience the life he wants for us. But so often, we're firing the arrows of our own decisions and they are missing the mark. That's all sin is. We don't need to overcomplicate it, right? And then last week, oh boy, we had a real treat. We had Fresno Deaf Fellowship with us and uh, Pastor Keith was teaching uh, through American Sign Language, through interpretation into English on Romans 3 and 4. Look, friends, if you were not here with us or weren't able to catch the broadcast last week, I mean, it is a, a church experience so cool and so unlike any other. It will bless your soul. So please go head over to our YouTube and find last week's gathering with Pastor Keith and our friends from Fresno Deaf Fellowship. Anyway, he was, he was teaching on Romans 3 and 4, which is all about understanding salvation, right? So we sin, we miss God's mark for our lives and that creates a problem between us and God and we can be saved. That, that problem can be reversed, it can be fixed, it can be overcome, that's what salvation is and we talked all about how to understand salvation. What's wrong with us as human beings? Why do we keep making an absolute dumpster fire of our lives? Sin. How does God fix that because his love Ah, through Jesus compels him to fix it for us, salvation. Today, we've got another super big church word for you. 
sanctification. Yes, sanctification. That just sounds a little bit pompous, right? Like, wouldn't you sanctified? Mm. What does that mean? I don't even know. Let's look at the Bible. So, sanctified, right? <laughs> it doesn't occur very often, as in ever, in our lives outside of church. It's all over the Apostle Paul's writing, and here's what it means. The process of growing in holiness. The process of growing in holiness. So when we encounter this in the Bible, in the New Testament, this person uh, was experiencing sanctification through the work of the Holy Spirit. That means that God poured his power out into this person's life, and they were able to grow in holiness in a way that they wouldn't be able to do without God's power. Here's the problem, right? What does holiness mean? This is another church word. We're so full of church words. It's better to be full of church words than other things. <laughs> Holiness, right? Holy is simply set apart. That's all it means. When you encounter it in the Bible, it was not an uber spiritual word in the ancient world in which the Bible was written. I keep pointing to this. This is not a Bible. This is an iPad Pro on which I have a Bible. Just so we're clear here. In the ancient world of the Bible, the word holy was totally normal. Anything could be holy. It simply meant set apart for a special purpose. So a piece of clothing could be holy totally outside of a religious context. I got a fancy gig uh, at work today, and so I got this holy shirt. Like, it's set apart to make me look good in front of my boss, right? Or I got a bunch of my guys, contractors, out in the field building a new structure to hold all of my grain because harvest is coming, and the foreman has a special task from me, the owner of the company, so I make him holy, I set them apart for a special task this week. That's all it means, right? So when it says, when it says in the Bible things like, God is holy, it means that he is set apart from the hot mess of humanity. <laughs> he is completely different. He's set apart, he is special. And when we encounter verses in the Bible that say things like, we've got to be holy because God is holy. And we invite Jesus into our lives and his work in our lives makes us holy. All that saying is as time goes by and we submit more to Jesus in our lives, progressively, we are saying no more to the kinds of decisions and living that creates the dumpster fire of our lives, right? And we are saying yes more to Jesus. And as we do that, friends, as we do that, we are setting ourselves by the power of Jesus farther and farther away from the dumpster fire of poor decisions and foolishness and missing the mark and all of these things that we really struggle with, no matter how long or how little we've been journeying with Jesus. So sanctification, friends, it's simply the process of becoming more set apart for God as time goes by. There's three steps. So in Romans 6, I love, I love Romans 6. I've come to love it. I didn't love it before this week. Not that I disliked it or anything. I just never studied it in depth, honestly. And uh, if you're like me, you like having a system and a plan and a place. And uh, everything has a place and everything in its place, you know? And it's rare in life with Jesus, as we learn from the Bible, to have a chapter in the Bible that says, do these things if you want life to be better. <laughs> It's just not always that cut and dried. Well, it is in Romans 6. If we want to grow in set apartness, we want to experience the fullness of God in our lives through Jesus, we need to do these three things, and we need to do them consistently. And the first is we need to know God's truth. We're gonna unpack each one of these this morning because this is what Romans 6 is all about. We need to know God's truth. There's a whole bunch of truths floating all over the world today. And there might even be a whole bunch of truths floating around in each of our heads this morning, right? So we need to know which one is God's because it is God's truth that defines truth for real in our lives. After we know this truth, we need to consider it. Like we need to sit with it, work through it, reflect on it, and choose to make it a part of our lives in a way that influences our lives. Can't just carry it around as a cool thing we know. And after we've decided, like we've worked through the reality of God's truth and what it means for our lives, it then motivates us to become sanctified, to set ourselves apart, 
to surrender every area of our lives over and over again, because it's hard and we, we kind of stink at it really badly and we backslide a lot, <laughs> to God's control. That is what we're gonna talk about today. So let's jump right into the text here. Chapter six, starting right in verse one. What should we say then? I'm gonna read this whole big thing and then we're gonna talk about it. It's a big chunk of text, I know, it's okay. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Chapter five ends with this really interesting statement where there, there is an antagonist attacking Paul's statements about how life with God works. Paul made this statement, the author, right? He made the statement that in our sin, God's glory becomes evident because the separation between the filth of us missing the mark and his purity and set-apartness, his holiness, man, that, that gap shows us just how awesome God is. And so the more we sin, so this antagonist is like, huh, hmm. The more we sin, shouldn't we just keep on sinning more and more then? Because the more we sin, the awesomer God looks. And Paul's like, no. <laughs> and so we find in verse two, absolutely not. Have you ever said that to a child? Like they came, came to you with an awesome idea that they had been hatching in, in their head that just has no connection to how reality and life actually works. And it, it requires something of you at the end to do something for them, some awesome thing. And they, they pitch the story and they get to the end and they're like, and that's why I need five brand new Xboxes. And you're like, absolutely not. That's what's happening here. And so we jump into verse two and we come in and Paul says, that is not what we should do. <laughs> Here's why. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or don't you know, are, are you unaware, don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with Jesus, with him in his death, we will also certainly be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection from death. For we know, the word know is really important, for we know that our old self, here it is friends, listen, our old self was crucified with Jesus so that our old self, the propensity to choose in favor of ourselves, thus creating an ever burning hotter dumpster fire of our lives. That, might be rendered powerless so that we no longer enslaved to it, sin, missing the mark. Since a person who has died is free from sin and we've died with Christ, therefore, that problem, hmm, you see where he's going here. Now, if we die with Christ, verse eight, we believe that we will also live with him because we know, there it is, is again, because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, won't die again, ha, he defeated it, he defeated it. For the death he died, he died to sin, listen to this, once for all time, for everybody, past, present, and future, it has been definitively dealt with. That's real good news, and we're gonna find out why. But the life he lives, he lives to God, for God, because of God, fully sanctified, set apart for the fullness of God to be evident through the life of Jesus. Oh, there's a lot of things to talk about. You can see why when we sit down and read that, you know, without any outside help or another book to help explain or whatever, it's kind of like, yeah, that seems super important. What does it mean, you know? So let me talk about baptism real quick because this can be a little bit of a confusing piece. And uh, in the ancient world, religions and cult religions, the time that the Bible was written, super common, most people in the ancient Roman world, right? This is the letter to the Romans. Paul was writing to the church in Rome, a very challenging, very worldly, very intellectual uh, place. And it was full of cult, uh, clubs, cult religions, various other flavors of religions, but the vast majority of them shared something in common. 
the way that you became part of the religion or the cult or the cult religion was that you were baptized into it through a process of initiation, okay? It wasn't always literally what we as modern humans think of as baptism in a uh, North American church context where you go under the water or you get sprinkled by water. We do the go under the water here at Bridge Church. You come out of the water. See, the, in, in the ancient world, baptism, it, it was not a special word, right? It's kind of a special word to us. Oh, baptize them, very good, that's good, you know. You're going public for Jesus. In the ancient world, to be baptized into, it's this word called bautizo, you could be bautizo into a cult, and it just simply meant that you were initiated into a cult. You could be bautizo into a club. It meant, you know, you guys, you wanted to like go to the Coliseum and watch the game together, right? You could be bautizo into a club that does that. You could be bautizo into the Jesus movement, this brand new infant movement around this rabbi, this Jewish rabbi who had supposedly arisen from the dead and was changing people's lives. You could be bautizo into that movement. How? Well, Romans 10, a couple chapters down the road, tells us. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 especially, but really the whole chapter, they say, if you believe in your heart, that Jesus is, who God says he is, who he says himself he is, that he died and that he rose for our sake, right? And that he rose from the dead. If you believe these things, you decide to believe them in your heart and then you confess them with your mouth that I am choosing to believe this worldview, not to the others you're initiated in. You are now part of the Jesus movement. That's what this is referring to. To be baptized into Christ in the context of Romans was to believe in your heart the reality of who Jesus was and what he did and to confess it with your mouth publicly. Now, oh, as the course of time went by, to identify uh, this, to go through this act of initiating yourselves, uh, believing and confessing and becoming part of the Christian movement, baptism as we understand it, a physical representation of this believing and confessing with our mouths became commonplace, right? We, we go under the water and we are buried. We are physically, symbolically buried. Our sin is buried. And then we wait a moment, hopefully not too long, because you know, it's hard to breathe under there. And then we come up out of the water, a physical representation that we have identified, we have believed and confessed this reality that we are made new. We have placed ourselves in Christ. That is the rite of initiation into the Christian movement. That's what it's talking about here. It's not talking about actual water baptism. So what do we do with this? Back to the text itself. The word no occurs in here three times. And any time you're reading the Bible, especially the New Testament, friends, and you find a word that repeats itself over and over, that is the Bible's way of saying, here it is, here's the important thing, this is the thing around which all of the other things in this passage revolve. If you wanna understand the whole passage, use this particular word because it's the key to everything else. That word in Romans 6 is no. To know, we have it three times in here. We know, don't you know that you're dead to sin and alive through Jesus? Because we know these things, then our lives can remember that we know we are. It's really important and it brings us to the first step in experiencing sanctification. Increasing set apartness for God in our lives. Step number one, we have to know what God says is true of us no matter what we think or feel about ourselves. That's why it repeats a bunch of times in here. That's why, don't, don't you know? Remember, we know, this is true of us, for we know that we are dead to sin and alive. Why is this repeated? Why is this a big deal? Friends, the experience of your own life tells you exactly why. Because we can give our lives to Jesus we can receive God's gift of salvation and we can park it on our butts right there and not grow any. 
We can, we can just wait around to hang out in whatever forever looks like with God and Jesus in community, because the Bible's clear about that much. Jesus even called it paradise, right? Right before he died, so we know it's gonna be legit. And we can receive that gift from God, and we can sit right in it and never allow God to transform us into the person he intended us to be. And that happens a lot of times when we begin to think and feel inaccurate things ourselves. We want to be a better person. (laughs) We want our lives to be filled up with good things from God, to say different, to think different, to believe different, to relate different, to work different, to give different, to be different. Jesus said, I came that you would have life and have it to the absolute full extent possible. John chapter 10. Where's that in my life? Well, frankly, I'm, I'm trying to make good decisions. I, I've accepted Jesus. I, I've given my life to him. I've placed my life in him. And I, I man, I, I, every time I make a bad decision, I just feel so, so bad. And I'm worried that God doesn't love me as much. And I'm stuck in this one particular area and I can't seem to get past it. And I just feel like I'm a little bit too far gone. Like God probably can't change this life. And if, if God's power in my life was there, why do I keep doing the same? You know, we know this, right? We, this is a narrative. We, a story we tell ourselves all the time. It can be so easy to receive the gift of salvation, to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and sit right there in salvation and never move into sanctification. Step number one, we have to be able to turn off, to say no to, to intentionally ignore those things about ourselves that are not true from God's perspective. We have to know, we have to know what God says is true about us. It doesn't matter that we feel dirty. God says we're clean. It doesn't matter that we feel shame. God says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter that I'm still afraid of what happens next someday when I die. God says perfect love casts out fear. We have to know these things. And if we don't, we will just accept whatever the narrative is in our head or whatever the cultural narrative describes about us or whatever our friends and family who don't know Jesus say about us. We'll accept those things as the truth that define us. Friends, the reality here, step number one in growing with Jesus and not just sitting saved, but becoming the person he, he, lo- he would love for you to be, he needs you to be. Step number one is getting the Bible in front of your face consistently. Because in the Bible, we find the one truth that smashes the other truths and defines them all. And it doesn't mean it's easy. Right, We're here in Romans and Pastor Jeff's like having to spend all of this time talking about an ancient Greek word because it's confusing and hard, but it's true. And if we don't open up the Bible and consistently read God's version of the story about me, I will allow the inaccurate things I think and feel the inaccurate things that others say about me and the hot trash that culture teaches to become the story about me. Step number one, friends, is just straight up knowing who we are when God sees us. And what he sees is the finished product. The last words the human Jesus spoke He's hanging on a cross, right? Romans were crazy fools. Like they invented crucifixion, the most brutal way to kill a human being. And Jesus is hanging up there, right? Slowly dying. Life is like literally draining out of him. Slowly suffocating. (laughs) I would be thinking about other things than y'all, honestly. (laughs) As much as I love you, Jesus was thinking about y'all and me. And everybody who has lived and lived now and will live, right? What was the last thing Jesus said? It is finished. (laughs) Ha! 
The shame you feel because you're saved, but you still struggle to make good decisions, it is finished. The fear you have that is still paralyzing to you and you're struggling to become a better version of yourself, the version you feel like is possible with Jesus, it is finished. The story your family, who has known you since you were born, continues to tell about you even though you have chosen to believe Jesus and try a different trajectory and you're doing your best and they won't stop berating you, it is finished. Friend, what God sees when he sees you, perfection, the finished product. And we will not know that. We will not be reminded of that. That story will not be the story that wins in our life if we are not reading that story consistently. If you wanna grow, you gotta know. <laughs> I didn't plan that, that's fun. <laughs> Step number one is you gotta know. Step number two, let's, let's move on and see what else we got here. We move on into Romans 6, verse 11. We discover that we gotta know who we are. We gotta know what God says is true about us. And in light of that, in light of verses one to 10, we find so, that's a statement that like sums everything up and says, because of this, then this. So, because of all of this truth that defines you from God's perspective, even if you don't feel like it's true, because of that, you must, like this language is an imperative you, you gotta do this, friends. You must consider yourselves dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. What God says is true, not what you think or feel. But the key word here is consider. It's the key word. Here's what it means. To consider is to determine something to be true as a result of the calculations you made about all the possibilities. <laughs> How interesting that the Bible chose this word, that God chose this word. It's like when you buy your first house, right? Hopefully, <laughs> you're exercising wisdom and calculating out all of the options, right? Financial things, philosophical things, the growth trajectory of your family, the neighborhood, the school districts, maybe God's call on the location of your family so that you can be a family for the valley through that neighborhood, whatever it is. And you actually sit with these things, legitimately work through them, put in the effort to calculate out the end road of the various decisions that can come from this one point in time in your life, how will these trajectories play out from where I sit now? And you come to a decision that you determine to be the best source of truth for that for your life when you're buying this house. This is where I'm gonna put my money and plant my family for these reasons that I believe to be true now that will remain true into the future. It's the same thing here. We sit down and we realize, I'm reading the Bible and God says what he sees in me is beautiful. I have newness of life. He loves me, and I am a completely new person that belongs as a son and daughter in his family. I don't feel that way, but this is what it says. And then we put in the work to sit in that reality and to calculate out, if I continue to believe lies about myself, my life is gonna head this direction. If I sit in God's truth, no matter how hard it is to accept and choose to accept it as the story that defines my life day after day, my life's gonna move in this way. And if I do nothing, if I just sit here, circle the wagons, be thankful for the fact that God saved me and close myself off to the world and relationships and everything and just wait around to be in eternity with God, this is the trajectory my life is gonna take. Friends, we do the work to consider what God is actually saying about our lives and what might happen in our lives if we moved forward in belief and not just accepted belief. That's a whole lot crammed into that one little bitty verse. Consider, don't just sit. Do the work to take the truth of God and to plant it in your life such a way that influences your life. 
Step number two, consider. Work through and accept as true what God says of you. This will be the motivation, friends. This will be the motivation for you and I to make room, to make the decisions necessary, to make room in our lives for more of God and less of ourselves. It's not enough to know. We gotta do the work to believe and let the belief influence us, not to just carry it around as something in our intellectual tool belt or something, you know? It's time to make a different choice. I think there's some of us this morning that are discovering, whether it's for a little season or whether we're in that season right now, or, or maybe we've been doing this for a long time, that we are sitting in our salvation experiencing very little sanctification. And we're probably feeling pretty, pretty bad about that right at this very moment. What I wanna tell you is, well, I wanna tell you two things, friends. One, you don't have to feel bad about that because the Bible teaches in Romans 8, just down the road here, there's no condemnation. There's no shame for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a lie you're feeling right now. You are the finished product. That's what God sees. What you're feeling in this moment is more accurately called conviction. Conviction is a new belief that enters our existing belief system and shakes it up so badly that we are compelled to make a different choice about what we believe. It's time. If you're sitting there and you're feeling that, it's time to make a different choice, friends. It's time to put in the work. Don't just sit in salvation and wait around. It's time to calculate out the trajectories of your life and to determine something new. If you are tired of the headache, stop banging into the wall, right? So, what do we do with that? How do we, how do we live that way? Before we get there, and there is an answer here in Romans 6, I wanna give... I wanna give an opportunity to those of us this morning that are feeling like I, I need to do that. I need to consider. I'm not to any other steps yet. I've, I've been trying to get some of God's truth into me and I need to work through it. I need to work with it. I need to let it sink in. If that is you this morning, I want you to text. This is gonna be really strange. I want you to text this number. It's me. This is my Google Voice number for church. Please don't spam me. Please don't send me your political opinions. <laughs> you know what I mean? Please don't tell me stuff about your favorite sports team or whatever, right? Go Niners. But <laughs> seriously though, some of us need to do, we need to do something this morning. We're past no, we're to the next step. Text this simple phrase to me. I accept God's truth. And what you're saying to me, more importantly, what you're saying to God is I will put in the work Starting this week, I will put in the work to go through the various truths, to continue to identify yours, and to put it inside me, and to choose in favor of it rather than anything else. And at a time unknown to you, because I want it to be a lovely surprise, I will respond to your text message. And I'll say, keep at it. Because I know from my own experience, how hard it is to do this over and over again in a way that changes my life through the power of Jesus. Because I know how much I love myself. And I bet you're an awful lot like that too. So sometime in the next couple weeks or months, I'm gonna respond to you and I'm gonna say, hey, well done. <laughs> it's finished. Keep at it, friend. What's the last thing? If we wanna experience growth in our lives, to become increasingly set apart, to make room for more of God in our lives through Jesus, right? Our relationship with Jesus, what do we gotta do? Let's, let's read the last part here, okay? This is gonna be a big chunk of text. Hang with me. Consider, and then what? In light of your considering, therefore, verse 12 opens up, Therefore, always means because of what just happened, because of that, then this. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires and do not offer, that's the key word here, offer, and do not offer any parts, listen for it, it's gonna show up a bunch of times. 
Do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. Don't keep choosing in favor of yourself. Don't keep sitting saved, but, but unsanctified. <laughs> as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourself to God as weapons for righteousness. Sin won't rule over you because you're not under the law, you are under God's grace. What then? What should we say about these things? Should we sin since we're not under the law anymore and we're under grace? Is that a license to do whatever we want because we're saved? No, that's exactly what we're saying this morning. You won't be sanctified. You won't grow that way if you live that way. What then? Don't you know, here it is, verse 16, don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as a slave, you're a slave of that one that you obey. And that can, that can either be sin, which leads to death, or obedience to God, which leads to righteousness. Thank God that although you used to be a slave to sin, you obeyed from the heart, right? Remember, believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth, that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. That's just a funky way of the Apostle Paul saying what you heard, the good news about Jesus. <laughs> And having been set free from sin, died with Jesus, rose with Jesus. Having been set free from sin, you became instead a slave to righteousness. And then he says, I'm using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh. <laughs> so I'm not gonna lie, friends. This is a little bit snobby of Paul. A little bit. He's like, look, you all are not as smart as me, so I'm gonna go ahead and use a, a word picture for you here. Thanks, Paul. It is helpful. For, listen, on we go. For just as you offered the parts of yourselves to impurity, to greater and greater lawlessness, to greater and greater sin, to missing the mark more and more, right? An ever, an ever hotter dumpster fire of your own stoking in your life, right? <laughs> so now offer... All of your life, all of the parts of your life as slaves to righteousness, here it is, here it is, which results in sanctification. Okay, now it goes on in verse 22 to say, since you have been set free from sin, I hope we hear that, it's over and over, you've been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, there it is, you have your growth, you have your change, which is sanctification, right there in the text. And I love this little, this little icing on the theological cake. And the outcome is eternal life. Yikes, that was a lot. But here's what we gotta pull from this, friends. The key word is offer, right? Offer, here's what it means. It means to make available and especially to put at someone's disposal. He uses this context about slaves and masters. This is ancient world context from the time when the Bible was written. And here's what he was saying. A slave was required to make themselves available to their master 24 hours a day at all times. Similarly, a slave was required to put all areas of their lives at their master's disposal as a tool a usable resource in the hands of their master. This is called surrendering. You have to surrender everything about yourself if you are a slave. And in the ancient world, slave, this, this kind of image for slavery was common. And he's, he's picking this up and creating a picture out of these words saying, you used to make all of your time, 24 hours a day, available before Jesus to sin, to the dumpster fire living. And in that former way, you used to make all of your body, all of your life's areas available as tools in the hands of your own foolish decision-making. But because you died with Jesus, and sin, that the effect of sin in your life, it's finished, is definitively finished, and you rose with Jesus to prove that it's finished, the new life is possible, that Jesus does win in the end, and he can do what he says he does in our lives because of these things. You are a slave to righteousness. You have the ability to change. You can grow even though the odds might tell you otherwise. You can move from here, hot dumpster fire of my own making, and progressively take steps away from it to become set apart through Jesus 
for more of God in your life in such a way that every time you take a step away, you are making room for God in your life. And the more room you build in God, build for God in your life, the more full your life gets. Jesus came to bring that full life. Without him, that full life is not possible. This is the function, the culmination of everything that life with Jesus is supposed to be about. Step by step, day by day, we know what God's truth says about us. We do the hard work necessary to say, I'm not just gonna believe that, it's going to inform my decisions in my life. And because it informs my decisions in my life, my life actually then functionally belongs to God. I wish I was better at this personally. I struggle with this. I've been trying to walk with Jesus my whole life. I, I mean, I've got some really, really bad dumpster fires along the way that the Holy Spirit Fire Department helped me put out, but I don't know, I just, I feel, I know that, I know that I'm not alone, I know that you guys, Everybody deals with this, and I think some of us are feeling this deeply this morning. I know there's some areas in my life where I feel this deeply this morning. I'm like, man, I gotta take some steps away. So my question for you this morning is what are those steps? If you have given your life to Jesus, what's your step this week? Is it to get into the Bible? Is it to be reminded of the truth that actually defines you rather than the truth you've been believing? Maybe you're getting into the Bible, but nothing's happening in your life. Maybe it's time to do the hard work of letting that sink so deeply that it actually affects the kinds of decisions you desire to make. Or maybe it's time to literally say, okay, I'm gonna release the areas that I've still been holding on to in my life to God's control. I'm gonna surrender. Friends, these are the steps to growth sanctification, to being someone through Jesus who is set apart and living a life so epic and full that it can't help but spill into the lives of the people around us. So my friends here on the music team are going to make room for you <laughs> this morning in this gathering. This isn't... Um, this isn't another worship song. Like you can sing or mouth the words if you want, but as we make room as a music team, the challenge, the call, the invitation from a loving father who sent a loving son for you is that you would take the step this morning, whatever step is necessary for you to make room this morning for more of God in your life, for sanctification, whatever step, you take this space, this next four minutes, before the realities of life hit you as you leave these doors, you, please friends, make room. And as, as a church family together, let's see what happens as we decide to make more room. 